welcome to Inside Out with me, Susan Madaris. Fracking or hydraulic fracturing is the process in which water, sand, and some chemicals are injected into the ground in a bid to extract oil or natural gas. Despite the fact that the United States has many fracking sites, a good number of Americans are concerned about the hazards that this process may cause. Geologic formations may contain large quantities of oil or gas, but have a poor flow rate due to low permeability or from damage or clogging of the formation during drilling. This is particularly true for tight sands, shales, and coal bed methane formations. Fracking or hydraulic fracturing provides a solution to this problem. Fracking is a process where water and a mix of other substances, some chemicals, also sand, are injected at high pressure into underground wells. The idea is specifically you're injecting this, these high, this high pressure material into a um, area under the ground in which there is some substance that you're trying to extract. And so the water, the high pressure water itself actually works to in essence break up or separate, cr create some cracks in the material in which you're injecting it into which allows whatever you're trying to extract, whether it be gas or oil or some other substances, to flow more easily through those cracks. And usually it's water plus a mix of sand and other chemicals. The idea behind the sand is the sand helps keeps the, keep those cracks open so the substances could flow through. So whatever you're trying to extract could flow through those cracks. Anthony Carpi is professor of environmental toxicology and chemistry at John Jay College. Carpi says that within the past decade, the combination of hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling has opened up shale deposits across the country and brought large-scale natural gas drilling to new regions. There's a bit of a misconception around fracking because fracking has been done for 60, 80 years. Um, it's a process that's traditionally done also in oil deposits has been done for many years to especially as a well gets older and you're trying to extract the last bit of oil from it with large reservoirs that there's a lot of liquid present or gas present it's not needed but as those wells begin to kind of come to the end of their lifespan usually fracking is employed i think it's gained in popularity recently because um, in New York State, as well as other parts of the U.S. And, and Europe, we're finding reservoirs of natural gas that we didn't previously um, consider important. And many of those deposits are, are not easy deposits. They're not large open pools, but what they in, in fact are, are deposits of natural gas that are distributed throughout porous rock like shale or some other media that's not easy to extract. However, with fracking, you can extract more of the substance from those mineral deposits. Elizabeth Geldman is Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the City University of New York, School of Public Health at Hunter College. Professor Geldman has been involved in the oil and gas industry since the early 1980s. She started off as a lawyer focusing on oil and gas for a Texas-based law firm. She's always been interested and concerned about the environmental and health aspects. With talk of possible fracking in upstate New York, notably in the Marcellus, which contains largely untapped natural gas reserves, comes growing concerns. In the United States, the Marcellus Shale runs across the southern tier and Finger Lakes regions of New York, eastern Ohio through western Maryland, and throughout most of West Virginia extending across the state line into extreme western Virginia. Parts in Pennsylvania and Ohio have already been tapped into for fracking. I see right now the um, state of law and regulation in terms of shale gas extraction very similar to the state of law of hazardous waste in the 70s and 80s. And we have an opportunity right now to really look at this stuff and see where we can build regulations that are going to balance environmental health issues with economic issues. 
The fracking process occurs after a well has been drilled and a steel pipe has been inserted into the well bore. The pipe is punctured within the target zones that contain oil or gas, so that when the fracturing fluid is injected into the well, it flows through the perforations into the target zones. As natural gas is relatively clean burning fossil fuel compared to oil and coal, it has been touted as a potential bridge fuel for addressing global climate change and transitioning to a future powered by low carbon renewable energy resources. However, numerous studies have revealed that fracking is harmful to the environment and will likely speed up global climate change if allowed to continue as is, without any restrictions. I think there have been problems with fracking. The, the, when you're um, drilling and um, fracking a material, you're creating cracks, you're allowing the substances in that material to move in all directions. They don't only move towards the pipe that's extracting these substances. So there's a concern that in fracking, bedrock, shale, what you're doing is freeing up these hydro hydrocarbons, which allow them to also move in other directions. And there's been concern that this could possibly um, contaminate drinking water and um, the subterranean sources of drinking water wells and those sorts of things. And there, there have been some cases in Pennsylvania and a few other places where there seems to be evidence. I know in Pennsylvania, they, they tend to find that those wells closer to areas to fracking sites have higher concentrations of methane and some other chemicals. So there's um, some evidence that fracking can release these hydrocarbons to drinking water. Concerns around fracking include groundwater contamination, risks to air quality, migration of gases and hydraulic fracturing chemicals to the surface, mishandling of waste, as well as the contribution of fracking to raise atmospheric CO2 levels by enabling the extraction of hydrocarbons from deep underground. Pacific wells can be fracked more than once as the company is trying to extract more and more hydrocarbons from it. So as the number of fracking times goes up, the um, opportunity for contaminating well water actually increases. And also another area that's not really being, that's important, that often is overlooked, is the fact that sometimes these above ground reservoirs, you inject this material into the ground, you then extract the water and you store it above ground. And those under, above ground reservoirs, if they're not properly controlled, if they're not properly treated, those could actually be a source of groundwater contamination as well. So is there a safe way to utilize fracking? Uh, we have been fracking in the United States for a long time, predominantly in Texas and Oklahoma and the West Coast. Uh, it's very, very recent that we've been doing it on the East Coast. And we've gone in the past eight years in the Marcellus Shale, particularly in Pennsylvania, from having eight wells to having 2,000 wells. So it, it's a big change because we're changing the topography of the area literally and we're changing agricultural areas into industrial areas. And the thing about shale gas extraction is it's heavy industry. And so even if you take out the environmental and health concerns based on just the fracking itself, um, you're changing the nature of the economy and the land from predominantly agricultural and recreational to industrial. And that leads to certain health and environmental concerns in and of itself, even if you take the fracking out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're seeing a real land use change in this area. And one of the questions that we need to be asking is, do we want that kind of land use change? Do we want to have um, our agricultural and recreational areas being heavy industry? Why not? Supporters argue that it's good for the economy, it creates jobs, and reduces the country's dependence on foreign oil. How long are these jobs going to last? Is the job going to be for a year, 10 years, 20 years, or is it going to be a real change? Um, what we've seen both out west as well as in Pennsylvania is what they call a boom-bust cycle. And so very often you'll see a lot of jobs being created as the drilling starts, um, not just for the extraction, but for all the people that are being housed in hotels and restaurants and things like that. Um, but as the drillers leave, there's no need for all these hotels and restaurants. And so very often those very businesses that did well go out of business. And so that's a concern for the communities. So what are the alternatives? In some areas, um, especially in the Middle East, they have these large pools of liquid oil or large pools of, of gas with, that aren't Im embedded too heavily in rock. And so those are easy to extract even without fracking. What we're finding in the U.S. 
is the, the hydrocarbon reservoirs that are left are those that are, are more kind of tied up, if you will, in, in rock and in shale and other sources. And so you need these more invasive techniques to extract those. So as far as I understand, for some of the resources that we're looking at, for example, in upstate New York, there aren't many alternatives that I know of to extract those. It's no secret that fracking remains controversial throughout the United States, and the heart of the battleground for this emotional debate is New York State, with its massive potential reserve of shale gas. The Catskill Mountains are a large area in the southeastern portion of New York State, approximately 100 miles northwest of New York City. Catskill Park, a 700,000 acre forest preserve, is protected from many forms of development under New York State law. I headed to the Catskills to find out what all the fuss was about. I had heard that there is a determined community of environmentalists and activists working hard to ensure that fracking never happens. Located in Youngsville, Catskill Mountain Keeper is a grassroots advocacy organization dedicated to protecting and preserving Catskill region. Committed to vigorously fighting threats to the region and pursuing opportunities for sustainable growth, they've been focused on maintaining the region's capacity to provide pure, unfiltered water to over 17 million people. Ramsey Adams is founder and the executive director of Catskill Mountain Keeper, along with co-founder and program director Wes Gillingham. They work through a network of concerned citizens to promote sustainable growth and protect the natural resources of the region. I met up with Wes at his home, which I should mention he built himself. Wes and his wife Amy are raising their two children on a land here in the Catskills that has been in his family for 55 years. For Wes, potential water contamination and pollution from the wells as a result of fracking is of course a cause for concern. You know, when the threat of drilling came to New York, one of the first things that a lot of groups were looking at is like, well, they shouldn't be doing it in the Catskills because the Catskills are so special. I mean, you have one of the largest um, wilderness areas in the east. Uh, you know, there's Okefenokee Swamp and the Everglades uh, and some places in, in North Carolina, but there's no wilderness area over 50,000 acres in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, or Rhode Island. You have the Catskills, the Adirondacks, the Green Mountains, yeah. and the White Mountains in New Hampshire, and an area around Maine. That's it for the whole eastern half of the U.S. There's this 700,000 acre area of New York that has a relatively intact ecosystem. That's also part of the story as to why New York City gets their drinking water from the Catskills, and Philadelphia gets a portion of their drinking water from the Catskills. I mean, the Catskills really are providing, and the Delaware River Basin, are providing you know, 17 million people with clean drinking water. After we learned about drilling, we realized it shouldn't just be, let's save the special place, but this is a real serious threat to anybody. Uh, and they shouldn't just be protecting New York City's water, they should be protecting everybody's water in New York. From 1997 to 2007, Wes and his wife ran a 150-member community-supported agriculture vegetable operation here in Youngsville, and for him and many like him, the fight hits too close to home. I would not want to impact the land that's provided me with a living and providing a place for my kids to have a healthy uh, upbringing. Um, and then, you know, I have a real strong attachment to this place from my relationship that I've developed in my ho whole life. And it's funny, but you know, there's that term, oh, not in my backyard, there are a bunch of NIMBYs. And I've always said to that argument, it's like, what's more important than protecting your own backyard? I mean, that's what this country was founded on. New York has been safe for the time being. The state has had a de facto moratorium on fracking. New York's Department of Environmental Conservation has carried out an extended review of the impacts of hydraulic fracturing. And more recently, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's health commissioner is reviewing the health effects of fracking. However, there is no word on when all that will end. In 2010, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimated that 70 to 140 billion gallons of water are used to fracture 35,000 wells in the United States each year. This is approximately the annual water consumption of 40 to 80 cities, each with a population of 50,000 individuals. The extraction of so much water for fracking has ecological impacts and dewatering of drinking water aquifers. 
The transportation of these millions of gallons of water requires an estimated 200 truck trips. West says not only does water used for hydraulic fracturing deplete fresh water supplies and impact the habitat, the transportation of so much water also affects air quality, safety and road repair issues. It has impacts to the air from the amount of trucks that are coming and going from a well pad, the, um, the diesel fuel that gets burned in the trucks, then there's emissions coming off of the well site itself, flaring, uh, then there's the in related infrastructure that goes with the fracking and gas production, the pipelines and compressor stations and storage facilities. Uh, there's basically, you know, there's so many impacts. Um, it's pretty overwhelming. If you haven't, if you've been asleep for the last six years in New York and haven't, and just learning about fracking, it's really overwhelming all the problems that come with it. The oil and gas industry and trade groups argue that chemicals typically make up 0.5 to 2 percent of the total volume of the fracturing fluid. However, a 4 million gallon fracturing operation would use from 80 to 330 tons of chemicals, potentially toxic substances like kerosene, methanol and sodium hydroxide. We've got uh, a chemical that they use to create a lot of viscosity in the fluid so that basically the, the frac sand, as it's referred to, but it's a, a, the, the industry calls it a propent, it's a fine particle that will go out into the rock formation. They have to make the fluid viscous enough so it'll carry that. Then they have to lubricate the frac sand. Um, they used to use diesel fuel, fuel for that and they use other chemicals. Um, that to take so that it's lubricated so it goes farther out into the formation. Then they have to use a chemical to break down that viscosity so they can get some of the fluid back and it doesn't clog the pores that they've created and the openings that they've created. Then they have to add biocides and fungicides to prevent fungus and bacteria from growing in those cracks, to the, which will then clog up the formation so the gas can't flow out. So you're talking about this like serious mix of, of toxic, toxic chemicals that they're using. Um, that has, you know, there's multiple places where that can go wrong. They can go wrong shipping the stuff into the site. It can go wrong on the site with hoses and um, fittings, which has happened. That, you know, we have cases of streams being contaminated. Then you've got the situation where after they fracked, then they've got this waste coming up and it's got to go somewhere. A few years ago, Pennsylvania was sending it to the public waste treatment facilities. And the Mahongahela River uh, had so much of a load of wastewater going into the river that Pittsburgh Steel shut down its operations because the, the amount of brine that was going into the river system, they were worried about causing corrosion on their, um, on their equipment at their intake valve. And that particular river, you know, serves as a drinking water source for people. Pennsylvania is just across the border from New York and produce 1.5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas using fracking through the first half of 2013. The University of Pittsburgh's Center for Healthy Environments and Communities found that organic compounds brought to the surface in the fracturing flowback or produced water often go into open impoundments, fracking ponds, where the volatile organic chemicals can off-gas into the air. This causes degradation of air quality as drilling increases. For example, in Texas, high levels of benzene have been measured in the air near wells in the Barnett shale gas fields. For Liz, the health impacts of shale gas extraction is the most important factor to be taken into consideration. That we don't have a baseline to see how many of various chemicals and how much methane, which is what natural gas is, is naturally occurring in the ground and in the air and in the water near some of these drill sites. Um, New York State presents an opportunity if we do decide to drill, which you know is one of the things that we're exploring, um, to build into permit process a baseline so an environmental assessment is done before any drilling gets done so we know exactly what is or isn't in the land and the water and if there's drilling we can make sure that if that is elevated there's fail safes to make sure that it's stopped and that um, protections are put in. She cites affirmative studies that show there are health concerns. One of the health concerns that was raised in a study that just came out with Duke University um, is that there is an ele they found an elevated level of um, radon, radium, in water that was um, 
found near a shale gas extraction site. One of the things is that the Marsalis shale is a high radon area, so when you're drilling for natural gas, you're also likely to get radon when you release it. And so we do know that there are elevated levels of radon and some of them have been spilled. We've also seen some studies that have been done, um, reported that show that there's elevated levels of some of these chemicals that are associated, not from the fracking itself, but from the shale gas extraction process where some of the water that's being stored has, um, after fracking, the, what's called produced waters, has spilled and has gone into nearby surface waters. She ends by noting that precautions need to be put in place before New York decides to start the extraction process. Among those precautions that I would like to see in the permit process is having a site assessment done to see what the state of the environment and the health is before drilling starts, so we can see what background is so that we can make sure that there is a excise tax that's going so that the drilling, if there is drilling, is going to benefit the communities that are involved and that whoever's doing the drilling is contributing their fair share, that there be a bond put in place that if, God forbid, that there is an accident, that there's money already available, um, a fund, if you will, to make sure that we can immediately go in and clean up and take care of different types of things, and that there's post-closure requirements so that we know that this well, whatever it's being drilled, is going to end. One of the concerns there is how are we going to close it safely? How are we going to monitor it to make sure that it stays safe and to make sure that before the drilling is put in place, the permit has money required to do that? And then the last thing is making sure that we're really mapping where these wells are, are being drilled. That's all the time we have for this edition of Inside Out. Thanks so much for staying with us and watching. Remember, you can always send me your emails to insideout at susanmadaris.com. I'm always looking forward to them. You can also follow me on Twitter for latest updates and discussions. Until next week and another show from all of us here in New York City, goodbye.